Good morning. Please take your seats. The program will begin in less than five minutes. Please take your seats. Please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to keep saying it till you all say good morning to me back. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kathy Ned, and I am the Chief Operating Officer and Associate Publisher of the Michigan Chronicle. We want to welcome you this morning to the Michigan Chronicle's Pancakes and Politics Speakers Forum. This is our 12th season and the third forum. And this morning, we're going to talk about uh, today's topic is Destination Detroit, creating a world-class hub for arts, culture, and entertainment. And we have the heads of uh, our area's cultural institutions here today, and they will be introduced formally a little later. We're going to do things a little bit differently this morning. Um, instead of calling up our host, I'm going to call up uh, my boss, the CEO of the Michigan Chronicle. Uh, well, actually, he's the publisher of the Michigan Chronicle. Well, really, I am, but he has the title of the Michigan Chronicle, and he's also the CEO of Real Times Media, which is our parent company. Uh, at this time, I'd like to bring to the podium Hiram Jackson. Good morning. Everybody up, wide awake, got your fill of pancakes. Jason, PNC table, you guys up? All right. I'm going to bring Rick up here to sing to wake you guys up or something. You ready? All right. Many of you know the routine. I think that this is a real important discussion today. You know, most of the things that we've done right as a region have been around arts and culture and entertainment. Um, you know, our, this community has really stepped up in the last several years for our cultural institutions. Uh, and I was just noticing, I actually sit on the board of two of these institutions, the, Char the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History and the, um, the Zoo. And so I know firsthand just how important these institutions are to our community 
and the rich experience that they bring to us and our families. And so it's important for us to support them. And I really see from the inside how many people actually attend these institutions. So I think this is a, a discussion that's long overdue because they do recognize all of the things that we've done right as a region. You know, when the community asked us to step up and support the zoo, we did that through a millage. We supported the DIA through a millage. And we've supported our other institutions like Belle Isle and even things like Cobo Hall. I, I think it's really time for us to step up and support the Charles H. Wright Museum as a community, right? I, I really, this is my own commentary, we really need to step up and as a region recognize the significance of the Charles H. Wright Museum and come up with a, a sustainable way to support it. It's too important, it's a jewel in our community and Detroiters when asked, we've supported everything, right? So I think it's time to support the Charles H. Wright in a very systematic, sustainable way. Now, I'll stop preaching. I want to thank the sponsors. Uh, I want to thank Henry Ford Health System and HAP, Health Alliance Plan, Comcast, Bank of America, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Chase, uh, FCA Chrysler, Quicken Loans, St. John's uh, Providence Health System, and UHY Advisors. Forget anybody? That's everybody. All right. Uh, you know, without these sponsors, I say it every time, uh, they have been amazing partners, 12 strong years. We've sold out every time except once. And so just please give our sponsors a round of applause. <laughs> so we are Facebooking live. So if you're supposed to be someplace else, <laughs> start ducking. And um, remember, we've been doing really well online with trending, so uh, I believe that the hashtags will be on the screen, Twitter, Facebook. Enjoy the conversation, and uh, have a good time. Um, I want to bring up Rick DeVore. He's president of PNC Bank of Michigan. Um, all of you know Rick. Uh, he and his team have been super men, super women for this institution. And um, Rick, can you bring a few greeting, words of greeting for us? Somebody left their phone up here? Um, for the PNC people, you do not want to hear me sing. All right, so let's just get clear on that. So st stay alive here. but. Uh, you know, we've been the sponsor here for a number of years. A lot of times you hear me up here talking about education, early childhood especially. It's extremely important. Um, but with that said, what you might not know about our firm is our, com our commitment to the arts. You know, we're STEAM people, we're not STEM people. And I said again, we're STEAM people, not STEM. Last three years, we have donated over $600,000 to the arts. Quite frankly, um, we're probably going to be pivoting next year to more support of the arts. That will lead for an uh, interesting exit plan, uh, Gina Coleman, when we leave today. But, uh, but, in all, <laughs> but in all sincerity, you know, we believe that no great city, and we believe we are in a great city, can thrive without the arts. We are blessed here to have great support of the arts, and I think it's really a key component in our region's recovery. Any time that you're recruiting somebody from outside this region, it's imperative that you have a strong commitment to the arts. It is part of who we are and part of who we need to be going forward. So we're very excited about that. In a moment, you are going to hear from Carol Kane, but um, just as an announcement, uh, Carol's legend uh, knows no end. But um, we're proud at PNC Bank to have sponsored the Power of Women on CBS. That show is up for an Emmy this way, this year, and I want to just congratulate CBS and Carol Kane on that achievement. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to turn this back over to the real boss, Kathy. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're ready to get going with the forum. I am pleased to announce that uh, Carol Kane is back. 
Um, we're glad to have her back. She is, she really doesn't need any introduction, but she is an Emmy Award winning journalist and the host of Michigan Matters CBS TV 62. Um, I knew she had won something since the last time we heard from her. So um, at this time, I'd like to bring to the stage Carol Kane. And I also want to mention uh, Vicki Thomas, who's going to be helping with the forum this morning, who is the City Beat reporter for WWJ 950, past president of NABJ, and she just does a lot of stuff too. Carol Kane. Thank you so much, Brandon. Good morning. How's everybody doing? I hope you're coffee ingested and ready to go and all that because we're going to have a fascinating conversation about something that is so important to our community. Um, I'm so happy to be here at the 2017 Pancakes and Politics, the third session, which is the headline of Destination Detroit, creating a world-class hub for arts, entertainment, and culture. Um, I grew up in Detroit on the east side, went to Detroit Public Schools, and this event talks about something that's part of the soul and the community of what Detroit is about. We hear so much about jobs and transportation and politics, and we don't really give that much attention to something that is so important and part of what we're all about here. So um, I, I do want to remind people that this is being live streamed, so for those of you who are watching elsewhere, hello, you're very happy you're watching in your sweats and PJs, and we're all here. We're giving you a shout out. And I know that there's a lot of tweeting going on and hashtags up there, so are there any newcomers to Pancakes here? If so, raise your hand, please. There are some newbies here. Okay, well, you'll see this as a destination for springtime uh, mornings and and this 12th season, it's amazing that every single one of these events, with the exception of one, has sold out. And uh, I think that's, that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> and that's all due to Hiram Jackson and Kathy Ned and all the folks here at uh, Michigan Chronicle and Real Times Media that know how to put on an event, to be certain. So the format of this is, is simple. We're going to introduce the panelists. We're going to start with questions. I'll start. Vicki's going to be there. She's going to have a microphone roving. If you have a question, kind of raise your hand. Vicki, where are you? I'm looking here. Where are you? Okay, over there. She has a microphone. We'll get to some questions and try to just kind of put a face a little bit on what's going on with our arts and culture and entertainment sector here. So without further ado, let me bring up our panelists, and let's start with George Anamadi, who is the president and founder of Namadi Center for Contemporary Art. He was born in Columbus, Ohio, came to Detroit with his wife to get his Ph.D. in psychology at U of M. He founded the Nataki Tablabi School House, which was a Detroit-based entertainment grade school, and which had a strong emphasis on art, and it was named after their late daughter. He now has the incredible uh, Namadi's Gallery, which is a catalyst in cementing Midtown's reputation as a creative community and gaining a national reputation for highlighting African-American artwork. Please welcome George Nanampi. Next is Juanita Moore, President and CEO of the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American Studies. It's the largest museum of its kind in the nation. Prior to her current post, she served as Executive Director of the American Jazz Museum and the Gem Theater in Kansas City. She also served as the Founding Executive Director of the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee, which oversaw the opening of the museum located at the Lorraine Motel, the site of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. She began her career at the Ohio Historical Museum, where she served as the first African-American curator. Art is her thing. Please welcome Juanita Moore. Ron Kagan, who I found out is, is amongst all our panelists today, the longest person in Detroit, 24 years, but it seems like only yesterday, right, Ron? Yeah. Okay. He's the CEO of the Detroit Zoological Society and has been an advocate and activist for compassionate conser conservation, animal welfare, and human education. He's worked at and consulted for numerous zoos and lectures at universities and conferences around the world. He's authored many papers and journals on this important topic. He's also been the force behind numerous wonderful exhibits and two come immediately to mind, that being the Ring of Life Polar Bear Exhibit and the Polk Penguin Conservation Center, which is the largest, largest penguin facility in the world here in Detroit. Ron Kagan.
And our final panelist is Salvador Salor Pons, President and CEO of the Detroit Institute of Arts. He joined DIA in 2008 as Assistant Curator of European Paintings. Before that was Senior Curator at the Meadows Museum at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. He's worked other places too and was an exhibition curator at the um, Mem Memo found it. Can you help a sister out? Memo. Memo. How do you say it? Come on up here. I don't speak. Okay. Come help me with my Spanish, please. Let's do it together. Here we go. Let's say it together. This is how it, this is how it Memo starts. Memo Foundation Palazzo Ruspoli in Rome. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> he also has authored a number of books and papers. So we have a panel here well versed in education, writing, and also in celebrating the arts. So let me just, we'll, let's put this out here for the panel. When we talk about Detroit, we talk about business and transportation, other things, we don't hear as much about the cultural institutions until there's a need for a millage or something like that, but <laughs> overview, not dealing with the finances, which is another question coming up here. But as you, how do you see arts and culture factoring into the story of Detroit right now? And Salvador, why don't you start off? Absolutely. I'll start by giving you my uh, live example. I was born and raised in Madrid and I had the very good luck to train as an art historian in Spain and then got my PhD uh, in Italy in the University of Bologna. I worked in Rome, in Florence, and I was very, very fortunate in my lab to have a wonderful education. And I, I came to Detroit uh, after having worked in Europe in many places because I wanted to work in a world-class museum, and the DIA was one of them. So the top museum in the country, one of the five uh, most important museums in the country with a great collection as a curator, I was really thrilled to be involved with a collection and a museum with the history of, of the DIA. So I think cities need to have important museums for them to be attractive to uh, uh, people with education, people with talent that comes from all over the world to enrich our community. And when I came here to the museum, I really focused on the, on the arts and because I was a curator. I did research and exhibitions, acquisitions, presentation in the galleries, and I really loved the art. But when I came, became the director of the museum, I thought it was important that um, art was not the end goal of the organization. I wanted the museum, I wanted the collection of the DIA to be the platform from which all our activities at the DIA depart. So we want a museum that plays an important role in the community, that helps uh, the revitalization of the city of Detroit, working with, with the mayor in the um, you know, revitalization of neighborhoods. How can we align our programs, exhibition programs, the work of our contemporary curators, doing public art in the neighborhoods, and then doing it in the museum, and helping with that. And also doing exhibitions that deal with important matters that are out there in the community, like gender, race, poverty. Can we do exhibitions that bring those matters up to the front stage through the lenses of arts, which is always beautiful, and help the conversation, help um, the community come together? So I see museums helping you know, the economic development of cities, bringing talent and um, a wonderful individuals to, to, to Detroit but at the same time, bringing the community together, having um, a better place to live for everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and so Juanita, how do you see the arts and culture factoring into the story of Detroit? It can, it, it can go beyond the Charles Wright Museum too, just overall, mm -hmm. how do you see it? Well, I totally agree with Salvador, and I'm gonna look this way because my mic's over here. He said, <laughs> he said if I look that way, <laughs> people may not hear me, so I'm not ignoring the side of the room. Um, <laughs> Actually, I totally agree with Salvador because, uh, you know, as, not only are the arts the, the, the contents and soul of a community, when, art, when Salvador talked about the important topics that arts bring about, uh, and, and we have to look at arts really very broadly, uh, and we start to understand that many of the things that we want to teach our children and we want our children to know, they learn many times in arts through film and through uh, theater and through dance and their music that really teaches uh, many of, uh, especially young people, about the things that's really most important about the community and hopefully galvanize them to become, uh, to be of service to the community and become the best citizens that they can be. Uh, in addition to that, 
Um, you, you mentioned that I worked at the Civil Rights Museum and in Kansas City at the Jazz Museum. And you think about the fact that in both those institutions, that was, those institutions were really very much involved with the tourism and the business part of the community, bringing thousands and thousands of people into the community. And I think that that's the same thing that has happened with Detroit. The fact that if you go to New York and people in Brooklyn you know, will say, uh, what's happening in Detroit? And I was at a dinner in, Detroit, in New York and they were complaining that their artists were all moving to Detroit. And so I, I think that arts play a really major role in the community and can continue to do so. And I think some of the programs, a lot of the programs that many of the institutions right now are partnering together with around 67 will do just that. When we start to think about how you look at an event in the history of a community that can really change the conversation and bring people together and start to think about how to make the future of a community better. That is one of those things. And so we, uh, the arts play a major role and we think they will continue to play a major role. Mm -hmm. Ron? Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine, you can answer it that way. That's I hope fine. that's eloquent enough. Um, that's brief. I'll, I'll just share a couple of, of quick anecdotes. Um, on September 11th, 2001, uh, after about two hours of the tragedy that happened to this country, the zoo was filled with people. Um, that We were not unique. That happened, uh, I think, in many museums across the country. But I think that's an important message. And, uh, and I'll combine that with the fact that on any given day, if you come to the zoo, you will see real diversity. You will see that we are a place where everybody feels they are equal, everybody feels they're welcome. And that's the power of nature. It's the power of an organization that believes that we are here to serve the community. Uh, for us, uh, this is really about affecting people's attitudes and values about nature and the more urbanized that we all become, the less connected to nature. And we really are a part of nature, we come from nature and yet we're separated from it. So for us, <clears throat> it's been very exciting because we've watched our audience grow pretty dramatically. Uh, we're now at 1.7 million people a year. That is really important for lots of reasons. Uh, economically, it's important because we generate well over $100 million of, of economic impact to the region uh, and create lots of jobs. So I know normally we wouldn't be talking about economics and things like that, but um, this represents uh, a real source of pride because there are only, I don't know, two or three other zoos in the country that have that kind of audience. So clearly, uh, there is a very important role in the daily lives of, of people in this region and as was mentioned at the very beginning, this regional thing is so incredibly important. Whether it's transportation, whether it's the arts, uh, we, we obviously are on a trajectory where there is a lot of cooperation now with Kobo and the DIA and the zoo. Um, and there needs to be a lot more um, if we want to be successful. Mm -hmm. George? Anything else? <laughs> ditto, ditto. Ditto, 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 okay. Uh, <laughs> well, mm. I think the arts are very important, of course. I moved uh, on just uh, 2001. I had my grand opening September the 12th. Oh. And <clears throat> it was one of those decisions you had to make at the time. And it's like, what do you do? Then I was there thinking, I said, if I don't do this, I'm going to sit in front of the television all day watching mm. the plane go into the building. So we decided to go ahead and have it. And it was the most successful opening that I ever had. It was wow. crowded, it was packed, people all on the street. Because you start looking at history and you see the role that the arts play in a community, both in terms of culture, but also in terms of the community's mental health. And that, by the way, that's mm -hmm. how I even started the gallery in the first place, is thinking uh, that uh, with the understanding that our mental health of the community is very important and the arts play a very connecting role in that. We moved here from Birmingham. We started in Detroit right over here in Paradise Valley Harmony Park. Uh, but we moved to Birmingham and was out there for 13 years. Then we decided to come back and we were located in Midtown. Now Midtown that you see now was not the one that was there 17 years ago. <coughs> it was a little different, you know. I know everybody thinks it's been like that, but just a little <laughs> bit, different, okay? But, but you can see how the arts was a catalyst 
for that whole area to bring, to bring the change. So I just think the arts are very, very important and all the different reasons that they have given, my panelists have given here, is, is the lifeblood. And by the way, Detroit already has it. Mm -hmm. We have such a vibrant, almost as underground, everybody calls it like, but we've been a city that mm -hmm. had a strong tradition of uh, being in the arts from mm -hmm. uh, Josephine Love, who had your heritage yes. house 40, 50 years ago, uh, where you have major artists say, oh yeah, I started my first class at Josephine Love, your heritage house. It was right here on Ferry. Now it's part of the ends on Ferry. But anyway, that's, you can see the history of it and the importance mm -hmm. of it. So a question for all of you, and you may have different answers to this. Um, what's the number one barrier you wish could be removed that would help your organization be able to do its job and its role even more effectively? What's the number one barrier? Juanita, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, well, I, the, the, um, the obvious answer is resources, honestly. <laughs> I mean, there's no reason to sort of not to skip over that. Um, that's the first and obvious answer is resources. Um, the, the, the arts, while we talk about how important they are, they are woefully underfunded. Um, that is not an area where, uh, a, even as a country, we really put a lot of resources. There is one federal institution, organization, that funds museums and libraries. The Institute of Museum and Library Services, that is the only part of federal funding that's dedicated to museums and libraries. And, and think about how many museums and libraries there are in this country with that one pot of federal dollars. And those are competitive dollars. It's not as if you can expect to get funding from that entity uh, on an ongoing basis. They, they have um, uh, a very small budget. You know, when, if you, when you heard the conversation about defunding IMLS, which is the Institute of Museum and Library Services, NEH, NEA, uh, people talked about what a woefully percent, small percentage of the federal uh, bu budget that, that is. And so when you're talking about one of those entities, you can imagine, and that's all there is to fund all of the institutions. So just think about that from the federal level. And then as you come down to state and local, uh, Makaka, at just a few years ago, Makaka has, was the, um, had the, the lowest amount of funding for any state arts institution in the country. We were below Alabama. So, um, and, and there is no city arts council, whereas many cities have an arts council that fund their, help fund their, their arts institutions. So um, resources is really, uh, just put it right out there, is, is one of those things that, that would be very, very important. It's very important for our institutions to exist. Anyone else want to weigh in on that, of the bar number one barrier for the resource issue? Um, sure. Um. The, the museum right now, how it's positioned uh, with our new strategic plan is that um, we would like to uh, become the town square of the community. You know, we sit in uh, midtown Detroit. And we want to become this gathering place where everybody is welcome and included and actually represented. We have this amazing collection that um, it really touches most of the cultures in the world. So our communities can actually go there and feel represented with our uh, with the collection. So now all uh, <coughs> our programs and exhibitions are geared to this uh, diversity and inclusion efforts that we have so we bring people in, in the museum. And our goal uh, for the future as we become uh, more and more regional and the museum for the entire state of Michigan is that we welcome to the DIA every year uh, one million visitors. For that, uh, we need to have uh, our facility ready. And you know, the most important obstacle, as, as uh, we were talking about, is the resources to have our facility as accessible as possible. And I'm talking specifically, and this is not very artistic, uh, about our parking structure. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have a great surf lot, surface lot that we, we share with the Charles Wright and other museums. The entire, the, the, we <laughs> share with the entire, was well, one parking lot for the entire Midtown. Yes. <laughs> But the Arts Cultural Center, the Cultural Center, we all yeah. share that. And uh, fortunately enough, the museum has an underground parking structure that uh, many of you have used in the past, I'm sure, but it's no longer, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it needs to be uh, restored. 
And uh, so we need some resources to put there so we can actually bring back that par uh, underground parking structure. So we could be adding to Midtown and to the cultural center another 350 uh, spaces for, for, uh, for our visitors that you know, visit the DIA, the Charles Wright, uh, and, and the other organizations. So that is, uh, I think, the most important obstacle for us is the accessibility to come uh, to, to the DIA, to the Charles Wright, to the Science Museum, to the Historic Historical uh, Museum, and really have the opportunity for people to park there and, and visit the area. Now with the queue line, you know, this is a fantastic opportunity because uh, people can even park in Midtown, take the queue line, and go to downtown. And of course, there are lots of sports uh, events happening there. And uh, our programs are starting to gear towards how can we partner with the, with the sports and bring the arts and sports together. And uh, having mm -hmm. a good uh, parking facility for everybody <laughs> there would be great. So we need some resources for it. <laughs> yeah. Ron? I think that um, Salvador just touched on the part that I see as the biggest problem. <laughs> um, you know, resources, we, we usually talk about sort of dividing it into two. One is money and the other is people. In terms of people, we are so unbelievably fortunate. In fact, many of the people in this room are critically involved either on boards or on the staffs of, of the cultural sector. And we have incredible um, staff and, and capacity. Uh, money is an issue. I think for, uh, parking is an issue for all of us. But, but in my view, the solution is not for us to keep all building more parking garages. We've got to get regional transit sorted out. This is a huge issue for all of the institutions. <laughs> You know, we serve 150,000 school children a year in various school programs. That's aside from just visitation. If there was proper regional transit, we'd probably have 300,000 school children. And there are so many people that can't come to the various cultural amenities in the region because they don't have easy access to, to, uh, to vehicles or transportation. So. Uh, I was joking with Matt Cullen the other day. I, I congratulated him on the queue line, and I said, this is the great first step to high-speed rail that goes up and down Woodward and then goes east and west and all that. We, we've got to get this done, and then we don't need to waste money on tens of millions of dollars of parking garages and more highways and the whole thing. So that's, I think, our biggest barrier. Mm -hmm. George, anything? Well, being number one, I guess somebody... <laughs> <coughs> I guess the resources are very important, but I think there's also an attitudinal thing that we have to address to a lot of your major cities that have uh, that are really known for their arts, their the philanthropic and the uh, corporate uh, citizens of those communities really do major stepping up in art. You know, like we need a percentage for art when for new construction. So this, when you had funding like that you begin to enrich uh, your city. Uh, developers, for instance, start competing with their arts. You know, so they usually go beyond what their percentage is. And they're like, well, we want to have something to bring it in. I was just having a discussion about art in Cobra Hall, where they're trying to raise uh, $5.5 million, which is very important. I said, well, Cobra Hall is very important because that's, for a lot of people, that's their gateway to Detroit. That some, a lot of them don't go any further from that. They come for a convention. They go to that, that, and then they go back to the West End with one of the hotels. I said, but when you have an art program, you know, it, it does say, hey, let's go out and explore more. Okay, so people look at the 5.5 million, whereas uh, McCormick in Chicago spent about 14 million for their art program. You see, so it's like we have to really catch up with that, you know, where it is important. You know, more art and co uh, corporate collections uh, I think all those things are very, very important because although the artists could be moving here, if we don't have ways to monetize where they could sell their works, and, they will leave. And I know Vicki's got a question here coming up, but real quickly, how do you make that happen? I mean, we know more funding is needed. Who, are, who should we be reaching out to? Who should you be reaching out to? What should the community be doing? Whose responsibility or whose call to action are we looking to? George, you well, I would look at uh, one, you know, the, well, the city, of course, from the, mayor, from the mayor's office, also uh, like the chamber, to start, because it is attitudinal things, you know, like mm -hmm. if the chamber does it, everybody kind of 
gets behind it, they get behind it, right? Uh, the mayor gets behind it, then it can happen. See, Detroit has for so long, we just was happy to have a building. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like we don't care what it looks like, let's get off, somebody's gonna build something, okay? It, you know, but it's like, we, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> but, uh, but, but we have to stop, we have to stop that and say, okay, what well, the design is important. You know, we want to be able to have, let's have some world-class design. It may cost you a little bit more, but let's go that extra mile with that. So I think with the chamber, the business community, uh, philanthropic community making these like a big change, not just uh, the change for, you know, like, oh, we, we, you know, we did this program and that program, but something that's structural that can last, like I said, percentage for art, and that becomes, like I said, competitive, so people think about the arts, you know, and they start putting that as part of their program. That also helps the children, because now they can grow up in a city where arts, they're making a living in arts. I always give this example about LA. You don't see programs in, like, uh, in the schools that say, oh, we're going to teach you how to be in the movies. They, you know, that's like, they look like, well, we grow up, we, what are you going to do? I'm going to be in the movies. That's their industry. They don't, you don't have to, just like we didn't have to teach people to go into the auto industry, you know, 30, 40 years ago. They're like, you graduate from high school? I got a job waiting for me, you know. But now we have to be able to have the adult professional art community being able to make a living. That's what keeps our talent here, mm -hmm. you know, is that they can make a living. Vicki? I was listening to the uh, conversation and I'm glad we're all having this conversation. I was just curious um, how many people had actually visited these institutions. So by a show of hands, how many people have been to the DIA? That's everybody. <laughs> <laughs> how many people to the Charles Wright Museum of African American History? That's everybody. <laughs> how about the zoo? <laughs> all right. And George's, uh, the Nanamdi Center for Contemporary wow. Art. That's great. All that's right, that's George. pretty good. I'm surprised. <laughs> wow. I think we need to get the message out maybe uh, outside of this room. But my question is, um, <clears throat> first of all, break down your funding calculation, your, your pool of funding, and then Talk about uh, whether or not you believe there are disparities in how some of the cultural institutions, entertainment venues are, are funded uh, from your own perspective. Uh, we'll start with, uh, how about you, Ron? Uh, so roughly 25% of our budget comes from the Tri-County Millage, um, and uh, roughly 25% comes from philanthropy, although we view donors more like investors than sort of just sort of charity um, because they're investing in the community. Um, and then half is, is direct earned revenue. Um, to the second part of your question, as I think everyone knows, we tried on two different occasions to get a millage passed that would have funded not the entire arts and culture community, but a large part of it. And the first time around, uh, which was gosh, I don't know, 14 or 15 years ago, we got ever so close to getting the Tri-County uh, to support it. The second time, we, we missed by a bit of a bigger margin. Um, I, you know, ideally, and there are communities that have done that, not a lot of them, but there are communities around the country. Ideally, that would be a wonderful thing to see in, uh, in Metro Detroit. Uh, if not, I think we're all in agreement. Um, you know, Juanita mentioned the IMLS, the annual budget of the IMLS for museums yeah, is less okay. than our annual budget. Yeah. That's for the whole country. Yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. Libraries are much larger. But yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. And uh, actually, I have, I, you wanted news. I'll give you bad news. We were uh, among 15 finalists for the National Museum Medal, which the IMLS gives out every year. Uh, there are 30,000 museums in the, in the country. We were one of 15 finalists. We found out yesterday we didn't get it. Aww. So there's our sad news. Uh, but again, uh, to everyone's point, there's nowhere nearly enough resource. Now, you've just heard Rick DeVore, uh, who is one of many great corporate leaders here, talk about 
shifting a little bit of the emphasis uh, from sports, even though we all love sports, there's enormous amounts of money in sports, not so much in arts and culture. Um, all of us could think more about investing more in arts and culture. George, how are you funded? So you look at it. Well, I, well, I'm uh, I am a 501. The Anomaly Center for Contemporary Art is a 501c3, but it's I developed it after coming to Detroit, and so I have a long history of being an art gallery, uh, uh, having an art gallery. Uh, we, by the way, we're like the oldest African-American-owned art gallery in the country. Uh, so I'm in this little spot where people see me as the art dealer and a nonprofit. So I'm not really in a position, I haven't placed myself in a position where I can get really funding. So right now, um, I just have to go out and earn it. Uh, so, but I figure one day, you know, I look at the long term picture, it, it, it'll come, you know, uh, maybe when somebody else takes over and, and I, you know, I'm gone, they said, oh, we can go donate to the Nomdi now. But it is, a, but it doesn't stop you, but it's like, it, it is a 501c3. And so right now, I just have to work and maybe sell something every now and then to make it happen. <laughs> And Juanita, we know we've had scares, um, you know, in, in, in the past of, of keeping the doors open at the, at the Charles Wright. And talk about how difficult it's been for you in terms of uh, keeping those doors open, getting the funding you need, and the breakdown of your funding. Okay. First of all, we can't kill George. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we have to support the Nomi Gallery. Um, Yes, the Charles H. Wright Museum, um, has, as, as everyone knows, has, has some really significant economic challenges, and as so has the city. And um, uh, I've, I've been at the Charles Wright 10 years. Uh, actually, I, I came in the end of 2006, and I thought I have a five-year plan, and I thought it was going to be really amazing, and I was going to do these things in five years, and then I was gone. And um, in 2008, the bottom fell out of everything. And so um, the, at that point, we had to decide what we were going to do. Um, and uh, it was really tough for everybody. I know the DIA closed some days, the Historical Museum closed some days, the Science Center ended up closing altogether. Um, and we had to decide how we were going to manage through that. And we decided that um, we would, because we said that when the economic times get better, you couldn't have just hunkered down and managed to keep your doors open. You had to say that you had some impact in the community. So we decided that we would um, not close our door, not reduce our hours at all. We would not reduce our hours to the public, and we would figure out how we would do that. Now, if there was nothing going on in the museum, we closed in the evening. But otherwise, we stayed open and kept our normal hours. The other thing that we decided to do is that we would increase our programming. And so, say, how are we going to increase our programming with no money? Uh, because at that point, we really had no money. Uh, but the thing is that there's, you talk about all the talent and arts going on in Detroit, and there's everybody, I bet, you know, everybody in this room knows at least 10 people that does some kind of programming, some kind of arts, and they want to do something. And, but none of them have a space. So we had a space. And Detroit is full of people with ideas and, and, and concepts and things that they want to do. So we open our doors to those people. And therefore, we really doubled our programming that we had been doing. And, and that really allowed us through the really toughest economic times to manage the museum and be very impactful and vibrant in the community. Um, that being said, uh, we, during that period, we lost all funding from GM and Chrysler, and for three straight years, we lost $500,000 a year from the city. And so, um, and we, you know, we did a lot of things, staff took cuts and everything, and we laid off as many people. Fortunately, we had restructured right before, so we didn't have to lay off as many people. But um, with, we had to decide then how we were going to manage the institution. And, as time went on, fortunately, uh, the Ford Foundation was stepping up, Kresge was stepping up, uh, McGregor stepped up for us. Uh, but during those very lean economic years, it was the Ford Motor Company that we really would have 
been in serious trouble without that support. And, um, you know, as, as time has gone on, we've been able to increase our individual giving. We started a gala, uh, which I have to really give credit to the women in Detroit that has, uh, they, they really managed to keep that museum going with our gala. And some of those women are in this room today. So I really want to say thank you so very, very much. And that gala was the underpinning of how uh, our museum during those very lean years made, made, made it through. And to the point that in our 50th anniversary, our gala committee of 83 women in this community and with Vivian Picard chairing it, raised $1.8 million for the museum. Mm. So um, hats off to women. <laughs> And, and, and so, you know, fortunately we've been able to regain some of our funding back from the city uh, that, we, that we have, and we now have a plan to really increase our in, in, earned income. But as um, Ron said, that they have 50% of in, earned income, and they still, and you know, zoos are very different in some ways, and, but at, even at 50% of earned income, and when I was at the National Civil Rights Museum, our earned income was 65% of our budget. And which is one of the highest in the country for any museum, but we still needed to uh, we needed philanthropic support that you just won't. I don't know of any museum in the country that's able to run their institution on earned income, no matter what anybody says. I've not seen it, um, and that's not needed. You know, additional support. The Getty needs additional support, um, and so um, we have been able to gain some funding back from the city, so now our city funding at this point is about 27% of our budget. Mm -hmm. And um, the bulk of our funding really does come from corporate and foundations, and that's about 34% of our budget. Uh, and the rest of our money comes from our, uh, earned income and donations, individual donations. Mm -hmm. All right. Salvador. So, <clears throat> as you all know, the DIA uh, is very, very uh, fortunate to have a millage like the zoo. And uh, uh, currently, 70% of our operating expenses are covered by the millage every year. And the other 30% comes from earned income, uh, philanthropy, and um, grants. And um, this is a temporary situation, as all you know, because in, in December 31st, 2022, the millage will expire and then we will have to see what we can do. And so in this, in this period, even though we, are, uh, we have a healthy uh, um, uh, operation, uh, we are in the process of getting as many resources as we can to strengthen our endowment for, for operations. So we are in the process of bringing our endowment of operations up to $400 million. And that would allow the DIA in January 1st, 2023, to actually financially stable and independent and continue to provide a similar service that we do today to the, to the community. So Vicki, I, I see uh, Rick DeVore Rick over there. A, I'm assuming yes. Rick may have a question. He does. <laughs> This is something I've been wondering about for about seven years, and now with the queue line up, I was sitting in the crowd Friday at the grand opening, and I was wondering about it again. Would, the, would you foresee ever, I, I hate to use this term, but like an easy pass where families can utilize the services of all of your facilities for some kind of price, especially given the queue line is now in existence? Would you ever see that kind of cooperation? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, um, fortunately for most people, um, right now, the Science Center and the Charles Wright Museum are the two institutions that charge that area. Everybody else, they're free. So, um, but the, I, I think that, I think we could do that because even at the DIA, even though it's free generally, there are prices for special exhibitions. So there is a way for all of us to really look at how we can partner to create some sort of uh, pass that goes from museums, and that happens in, in a lot of different areas and in, in communities that that happens, so absolutely. So anyone else on that before we move I, I think on? it's a model as used in other cities. I, as I mentioned, I lived in Rome and in Flores when I was uh, 
studying in university right after, and, and you can buy those passes that get you to different museums, and uh, you, you actually get a better deal, and uh, uh, you can actually combine it with transportation as well, and it's, it's a great way of, of partnering and offering better uh, programs, exhibitions, and experiences in the city. Mm -hmm. So Vicki, I know there's some other questions over here. I saw some hands earlier, so maybe while you're walking over there, can I ask a quick question here of you? You talked about arts and the fact that it's a lure of millennials in particular, this age group. We know there's an excitement. We know more young people are moving back to Detroit. Is there any great idea or anything you've seen in other cities offering to help bring, to make Detroit's imprint, its, its brand more revolving around art than currently, whether it be an advertising campaign or a marketing campaign? Any ideas come forth here of things that maybe we might want to consider borrowing or stealing? Anyone? Well, I will just tell you that uh, one word, <laughs> alcohol. Um, <laughs> For those of you that uh, may have heard of this, at the zoo we've started a few years ago some special events in the evenings that are meant just for adults. Um, and Wild Beast, Wild Wine, Zoo Brew, things like that. Um, Love Gone Wild on, on Valentine's where we give also, our, our chief life sciences officer gives a talk about sex in the animal kingdom. <laughs> and, he's, and he's from Kansas. So it is really amazing to hear him talk about that. Um, but I think, you know, the reality is we need to attract people to at least taste uh, what, what the arts and culture sector is. And it, sometimes it's that simple. Uh, you create events that you know young people like to do. Um, and it's fantastic. And I know the DIA has many uh, events like that as well. So. And alcohol, too? <laughs> <laughs> you have really fine wine, don't you? <clears throat> no, we have these Friday night events that yeah. are just terrific. And we do a special uh, programs for the college kids when we have exhibitions. It's college night. And the museum is absolutely transformed by all of them. We have sometimes 400, 500 coming to the exhibition. We offer them some snacks and, and things, and they can go to the, to the show. One of the... Um, other thing that I think is, is, is working well with the younger generation, the millennials, is the uh, uh, implementation of technology in the yeah. galleries. It's a wonderful bridge between uh, the art of the dead artist and well, your smartphone and uh, smart devices. So we recently um, um, implemented this pilot um, tour called Lumin, in which when you go into the museum, uh, we give you a Lenovo device that uh, combines uh, augmented reality and 3D mapping. And augmented reality is basically when you put your device in front of an object, you can see it through it as it was originally and what it was used. And 3D mapping is very important because the building is old and has different additions, so it basically works as a navigator, takes you from point A to point B. Normally, you see people wandering around the museum. I mean, wayfinding is, is, is a problem for us. This has been a great thing to connect better with the millennials. And uh, um, we recently received a fantastic grant from the Knight Foundation to actually expand it uh, through, the entire, through the entire building. And other museums are coming. You were asking what other museums do. I think Detroit does lots of things that other museums and other organizations come to see. And, and we have already visitors from other places to see how this uh, technology is being used. One of our we're, biggest oh. things here. Go ahead. In Detroit, it's like I said earlier, that we do a lot of things here. Yeah. We're very progressive in the arts. Uh, we have many, like um, at one time, I remember the artist Romare Bearden. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, with Romare Bearden had a major retrospective of his work, and 25% of the retrospective came from Metro Detroit. Right. Yeah. You know, you're like, wait yeah. a minute, this <laughs> uh, is collected all over the world. And you do a major retrospective, and 25% come from the city. You, uh, this, our metropolitan area, that you wouldn't think that, you know, uh, that, but we have things, but one thing we don't do, we really don't promote ourselves right. as right. much as we should. Yeah. We're within four and a half hour drive of 50 million people. So just think about, uh, I'm from Columbus, people don't really know that, they think I was born here, but, uh, but Columbus, when I was a kid, you're like, oh man, 
I'm going to save up some money and go to Detroit. I'm going to go to that place they call it 20 grand. <laughs> and, you know, so, but these are weak, you know, so you have people like that, you know, you come for the weekend, two days. And so when you're within 50 million people who can drive here, you know, they leave work early on Friday, they're here, they can do the, you see it doing the uh, jazz festivals and music festivals. Yeah. You see them, they come. A lot of them is driving here. But we could have that almost every weekend, people, just like in Chicago. What they, you say the ad in Chicago where they said in February, they said it's hot in Chicago, y'all should get here. Okay? <laughs> this is the, that's their ad in February. Okay? You know how cold mm -hmm. it's in Chicago in February. So I think we really do not promote ourselves mm -hmm. like we do. We still dealing with this inferiority, superiority complex, and we just don't know how it mm -hmm. falls. And I, I totally agree with you because I, I think that, and we definitely don't promote the arts. We definitely don't put any money in promoting the arts. And you, like you said, you go to Chicago and you can't, you know, you can't walk down the streets um, because people are out there doing programming and stuff at night and, and it's cold. Uh, but I was going to mention that the Brooklyn Museum has done an amazing job with social media right. in terms of mm -hmm. uh, in a, lot, a lot with their collections and wayfinding, but also just inviting young people into their museum at night to just, you know, they, they're looking at things and they're tweeting out. They have an amazing social media program that brings in young people by the thousands in the Brooklyn Museum. Mm -hmm. The other one is the Whitney. Uh, I went to see the Whitney Biennial because at the Whitney Biennial, we have some amazing Detroit artists at the Whitney Biennial, right. so mm -hmm. you should go see them. Yep. Uh, and, you know, it was, I, I had gone over uh, to Brooklyn to the museum, and then I, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to miss the Whitney. It was 10 o'clock at night, and it was full of, it was like date night in there. Uh, and because I'm thinking about what are all these guys doing and you know with the and they and they were strolling around with young girls and young people and so it was really like date night at the Whitney. <laughs> Who ever heard of date night at the museum? <laughs> so I, I thought. She didn't mean it like that. No. What did I say? Uh, <laughs> I don't know what I said. You don't know what you mean. No. <laughs> but, but we should, I, I think that Maybe it's as, as, a, as, a, as a cultural hub, yeah. as a cultural center and a hub, we need to create uh, something that brings in young people. Uh, and, and, and because, you know, that, that we stay open a lot later for them because they don't come out until late. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that that's an opportunity for us to do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, we have a question over here. So good morning. Pamela Moore from the Detroit Public Schools Foundation. Thank you for what you all do for the district and the wonderful partnerships that we've had. Um, and please go and see the, the 80th art exhibit uh, for the district at the DIA, yep. which runs through May 28th. 80 years we've been doing that. So thank you for what you do. We don't have the resources that we had uh, in the past at the district. And so we're trying to think of ways to do uh, these partnerships in a, in a more uh, coordinated way. So maybe you can speak to how we could do that. You know, in the programming that we do right now, it's in line with state curriculum standards, and it's wonderful, and we partner with all of you. But you know how important it is that our children and their families and their parents get to see what you do in the arts and the culture inside of the city and outside of the city. So maybe there's a way for us to figure out what the best programming is for elementary, for middle, for high, high school. And, and, and be more coordinated so that we can identify those resources and, and make sure that every child in the district uh, is exposed. So maybe you can tell us how we can do what we do better, or is there a way we can all get in the same room and figure out how to be more coordinated? Thanks. Well, in the museum, as you, was, you were mentioning, um, we do the uh, exhibition, which is a terrific thing. I really love it, having the uh, students show in the museum. And uh, now we have it in the temporary exhibition galleries, but my intention is to actually have it in the permanent galleries so the kids see themselves next to Warhol or Rothko because that is going you know, to um, be in their memory forever. You know? And many artists who participated in, this, um, in the DPA show at the DIA, they became 
very good artists. I'm just thinking of Mario Moore and others who, for the first time, showed at the DI when they were kids. And we love to partner with that, and I want to explore how we can do it even better. One of the things that the DI team is doing, especially in our education department, is meeting with the teachers in the schools. So we have gatherings, and with them, you know, we understand what are the goals of those schools, and we help them you know, shape the curriculum and the progress that we do in the museum that uh, when the kids come to the DIA, uh, the, the, these schools can actually, through these programs, meet better uh, their goals. And I have to say that one of the amazing things about this millage that is, ama I mean, we're super grateful, is that we receive every year over 70,000 students to the DI, and we bus them to the DI, and we do, they have free admission, we pay for the buses, and we provide all these programs, and we work uh, with, with the teachers. I like to think how this amazing resource can be used in partnership, for example, with the child's right, our neighbors. Can the students, when they come to the DIA, go as well to, to, to uh, our neighbor, neighboring institutions? This is to show how a millage, uh, a millage that could be beneficial for many cultural organizations in Midtown, could be something really amazing for, 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 for the community. Mm -hmm. So yes, I mean, we would like to work closer and uh, uh, we also like to have some feedback from uh, the work that we do with you so we can improve our operation. See, you heard it first from Salvador. We need a millage so we can be free to. <laughs> <laughs> we would there like, we go. I, mean, it's, I think it's, it's a great benefit and we can share it with you. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's just really perfect. <laughs> one question, be, one more question from the audience. Hi, I'm Laura Sigmund, Best Practices Consulting Services. And to the panel, I noticed that in Vegas and LA and a few other places, as you've already mentioned, there's a lot of cross-marketing. What are we doing to utilize the Pure Michigan campaign to bring more visibility to all of the arts and culture that you have here in our great city of Detroit? What are you doing with that? Well, I don't know exactly how much Pure Michigan is focusing on Detroit. Uh, usually uh, it's showing the waters of the Great Lakes. Uh, I was on the, the, the State Arts Council uh, some years ago, and their emphasis was not urban, you see. It, and so sometimes you see a baseball game as part of their ad, but I think that is a resource that maybe we should be talking to the state about spending more uh, that monies for those advertising programs to be they attract people to Detroit, you know. Uh, so I think that it is very important, and it's a resource that I think it has it has to be emphasized. Has someone tackle it? But I think one thing about all our this is like maybe it's some of the sidebar here, but we're doing a lot of things in the arts here. But I think we always got to remember why people are moving to Detroit. Mm -hmm. And part of that is our energy. You know, you come here, people like the young people come, I'm going to get a nice, I'm going to get a $1,000 house and fix it up, you know, but that's, that's short lived, <laughs> you know. But, you know, you come for the arts, but why do you really stay? And when people, the people who stay in Detroit, they get, they get it. And I think that that it is its authenticity. I call it the funk, okay? There's a little funk that you can get, and once you get it, you're like, oh, I'm a Detroiter. You know when people say, I'm a Detroiter, right? So that means you got that funk that got into you, right? So, but, but that's why you really stay. And so in all our developments and all our talk about the arts, if we lose that authenticity, we lose that funk, then we will end up being just one of the homogenized cities with uh, all the, the chains of this, the that, the that, you know, just like America, you know, just, you know, you got, everybody has the cheesecake, we don't have a cheesecake factory yet, but a cheesecake factory, you know, everybody has the same thing. So that's what our, that, that authenticity that we have, we must try to maintain that, keep a hold of that, because that's really why you stay. Other than that, you might as well go to, 
States. Any city, USA. So as we're, we sort of started talking off about helped, helping to set the arts and cultural apart, you mentioned about the resources, you mentioned the chamber and the mayor. So let's just say, for the sake of conversation, you had the mayor and you had Sandy Brewer from the chamber sitting in front of you, make, and you were making a plea to them about putting more emphasis, more resources, more energy behind arts. What would you say? And Ron, why don't I start with you? Well, I, first of all, I would ask that the, that group be expanded because it should include uh, the state of Michigan and Pure Michigan, and it should include the Metro Detroit Visitor and Convention Bureau. Uh, and the bureau does promote arts and culture, but not enough. Uh, I serve on the board, so I can say that. Um, <laughs> in any event, I, I'm, I mean, I think we would say what we said at the beginning, which is that we have a very unique uh, impact on community, not just in Detroit, but and pick a city in the United States. Um, and we enrich people's lives in a way that nothing else does. Um, it often shapes their future. You know, people, I'm sure everyone in the room has heard of STEAM um, and the emphasis in, in teaching science and, and engineering and technology and arts and math. And, you know, this is something that happens in the cultural sector in a way that does not happen in schools. Schools are incredibly important, but um, the kind of experience, the real life experience that people have, especially young people, is transformational. And we all have so many anecdotes of kids that experience something in our, in our places and then that gave them a direction in life that otherwise they wouldn't have had. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I actually would sit with them and I would ask them the question, how can the DI can be helpful to your, uh, to the city, to the organizations that you support? I, I think about the DI as the useful institution, as a tool for the community. How can the museum do programs, exhibitions, whatever our operation does that aligns, for example, with the work that the mayor is doing, the great work that the mayor is doing in the city. And how can we collaborate in that? And if I think if we find this kinds of partnerships, and it could be also with, not only with the mayor, but with the Charles Wright or other institutions, I think when people see those kinds of partnerships and collaborations towards a goal that benefits the community, I think the resources come. I would give them a cultural tour. I would, <laughs> I would give them a cultural tour of the city and really, and, and let them see the, the amazing examples of what arts uh, uh, do for the city and for the citizens of, of, of this city. And I think that they, would, they could you know, not walk away from there um, with a, a real need to, um, to, to, to really support the arts, make sure that it is marketed broadly because that's going to sell the city. It will right. sell the city to the rest of the world. And, uh, I, and I think that the important thing for all of us, the reason that we can all um, be so happy about what we do and feel really good about it is because, honestly, the rest of the world sees it so much clearer. And, and, and every time you go someplace, they talk about it. You know, they talk about, you know, George talked about the funk of Detroit. Uh, and you can call it whatever, but so many other people in so many other places um, understand the creativity that Detroit brings and gives to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And they, 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 they may not want to come here and live, but they want to come and see it. They want to come and talk to you about it. You know, Salvador saying that so many people come and talk to them about what they're doing, how mm -hmm. they do it. And it's not just our institutions that's, that's sitting on this stage. Uh, you know, I see people from other institutions, cultural institutions in this city and in this region that's in the audience. And it's the same. Mm -hmm. Everywhere they go, people want to know what we do. They want to know what's, when they say what's happening in Detroit, you start to say, well, Detroit's doing terrific and da 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 da, -da. Uh, I'm trying to think, where was I? I was, um, with, um, I was in Israel last week with other people that I see in the room <laughs> and on a cultural tour. And people, I, I, I must have gotten 16 messages about Dan Gilbert doing um, uh, uh, Charles McGee's Unity, uh, going to do an 11-story image of Charles McGee's Unity. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was getting it because we were very fortunate to un unveil uh, last mm -hmm. July um, United We Stand, another sculpture of Charles McGee. But 
I mean, people, and, they were, and it was coming from other places, not Detroit. Those emails were coming from other places. So people do pay attention to what's going on in Detroit, and I think that we have to pay more attention, and that's why I would give them a culture tour. So, why, so is that going to happen? Here's the question. you got the four of you here. Reach out. Have you tried to set something like that up? We the, ha I have not. So well. I'm going to challenge and give assignments to you. <laughs> George, you going to take care of that? I'll take care of it. Okay. <laughs> I was going to all of these men sitting here. Okay. <laughs> well, I think, I think uh, one, you know, everyone, we can always talk about the economic benefits from the arts, but I would like to probably uh, also know that the tour is great, I think, because a lot of times people don't even know what we have in our own community. Mm -hmm. But I would like to even show them the different jobs mm -hmm. that can come from the arts. Right. I, I just give a, one example. I mean, and these jobs could be people, just community jobs, you know, like shippers. Uh, the people who handle yeah. art, to ship it, go across the country around, and they, I th some of those guys, they make uh, twenty-five, thirty dollars an hour. Okay, I mean, you don't see, the, but you don't see that. You just think it's the artist, you know. Mm -hmm. But here, we're getting photographed now. It's <laughs> an artist, right? I mean, yeah. you know, if you have a musician at one of your dinners or something like that, that's that's an artist. That's the person who's bringing the equipment. That's how the arts end up creating multiple jobs. And a lot of times, they, you just don't get to see it. You know, you just don't, you, it's hard to imagine. Because when you think about the arts, you just think about that one layer. Yeah. You know, it's like looking at a movie and you only look at the actors. I always say, look at that, look at, look <laughs> at the, credits, the credits, look at the credits. That's a lot of jobs. And those, the credits are the ones who are working the most often. You know, not the actors, you know. So I think showing that is very, very important. You know, showing, you know, like particularly like the movie industry, if we can get that back and going. The movie industry to me is so very important that if we to, to have something like that because that one, it brings people here, it brings that entertainment, those stars here, and they get to stay for a while. It's very different coming for a concert, you go to the box and you're out of here. Yeah. You know, but if you have to be here for six weeks to do a movie, next thing you know, you're into the movie. Unfortunately, you know? George, I had to say this, that's a talk show for another pancake of okay, politics. Right. Bringing back right. those movie credits. Yeah, okay. We did have the best ones for a long time, yes. and they're gone, and I think you need to talk to the governor about that. So I want to thank you guys so much for being here and, and sharing your thoughts on culture and arts. I think we'd all agree that we're blessed to have these cultural jewels, these incredible leaders. And a reminder that the next and last Pancakes will be on June 15th back here at the DAC. And it's the CEO's turn as we have Max Simon, Matt Simoncini of Lear, uh, Cindy Paskey, Jerry Anderson, and Bill Picard. You won't want to miss it. It's guaranteed to be another barn burner. So uh, those of you who know who you are should come up here for some pictures. Other than that, enjoy the rest of your day. and. Uh, Drive safely.